All right, praise Open the Lord. Again. Good evening, folks. We're having a bit of a challenge as we started just now with our Instagram camera. Um, take it, take it out all the way, and yeah. redo it. And uh, we're going to go ahead and work on that while uh, I begin the service tonight. <clears throat> Let's begin with prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that there's no other name under heaven by which my men might be saved. And that the use of that name, you said every knee must bow. So in Jesus' name, Father, we declare this pandemic ended, the truth revealed, and all the mandates and all the things they're trying to do to to shut people up and hold them back. And uh, Father, that is bound. I break it in Jesus' name. I declare that we have a free voice. We have a free uh, nation in every respect in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that tonight as I teach the word, the Holy Spirit rises up within me, reveals to me what I need to know. And I'll speak as an oracle of God. The wisdom of God will flow. The revelations, Father, of your word are going to flow. The gifts of the Spirit are going to flow to minister to people's needs this night. I thank you for it, and I give you the glory for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you getting it? Just keep doing the same thing. I have to go all the way out. Well, you know how to double-click the bottom button, get it all the way out? Yeah, I did. Okay. So we're going to go ahead, and she's going to work on that, see if she can get Instagram up and running. And uh, we're, I'm just going to move ahead. So I want to read Psalm 91. I think I missed it last week. Uh, I don't know if, it's, uh, if I read it last Tuesday night or Sunday morning. I'm not sure. But this is obviously a good time to declare these uh, truths over our lives. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. We will say of the Lord, He is our refuge and our fortress, our God. On him we lean and rely, and in him we confidently trust. Therefore, he will deliver us <clears throat> from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings shall we trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to us. We shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the air of the evil plots and the slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. Only a spectator shall we be, ourselves inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High, as we witness the reward of the wicked. Because we have made the Lord our refuge and the Most High our dwelling place, there shall no evil befall us, nor any plague or calamity come near our dwelling or near our family, in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> For he will give his angels charge over us to accompany, defend, and preserve us in all of our ways of obedience and service. They shall bear us up on their hands, lest we dash our foot against the stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent shall we trample underfoot. Because we have set our love upon him, therefore he will deliver us. He will set us on high because we know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, and kindness, and trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake us, no, never. We shall call upon him, and he will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor us. And with long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. Praise God. That's a good confession, no matter uh, day in, day out, morning, noon, and night, you know, Every day of the week, that's a great confession to, to make. I need to get my monitor working here, so if you'll bear with me, uh, it'll just take me a minute and make sure everything is working right. This is the routine I temporarily have to go through every time we uh, broadcast. So first I have to find my page and make sure that I'm broadcasting there. <coughs> There I am. Okay, now I've got to share it. By the way, while I'm sharing this, why don't you share it on whatever device and whatever platform you're on. You're either going to be on Facebook or Instagram. And I don't know what the, uh, I don't know how that works on other, I know Facebook, you share it. Uh, but why don't you go ahead and do that while I'm getting my monitor uh, working right now. 
and I bind up whatever's causing Instagram to have a problem tonight. In the name of Jesus, I command Instagram to work, the signal to be strong. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. God is good, and he's good to us. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so just about got this one done. It says posting. All right, now I can go back to the page I started on, and I can monitor things from there. Hallelujah. Okay. It just keeps doing it. So, for some reason, Instagram, hey Torsha, good to have you with us. Hallelujah. Uh, <clears throat> for some reason, uh, we're having a bit of a challenge with Instagram tonight. Uh, we don't know why, because it should be working. Mary, go back to... Um, settings and make sure we're on the 5G setting. Yeah, I did that and it looked like we were, but I won't try. You got to touch it if it's not at the top. Praise God. We're going to get into a new study tonight. And um, this is, uh, the title is Spiritual Gifts or Spiritual Giftings, however you want to write your notes. So okay, so go back to Instagram, do the double click to clear it out and start over again. Um, however you want to title this, uh, Spiritual Gifts or Spiritual Giftings. Uh, I do want to share a couple of things with you. I, um, I walked, a, I have a circuit here in the house that I created for me to walk. Uh, I made uh, eight laps of that without having to have the um, um, walker, you know, that you lean on with wheels. I kind of just drug it with me. <laughs> so I'm doing good there. Uh, each night there's less and less pain and more and more sleep and uh, because I'm redeemed from the curse and I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Last night we had a bit of an interruption about 3.30 in the morning all of a sudden on the monitor they, they, have, they have a monitor beside the bed that has a number of different lights on it for different things and they all started flashing at the same time and woke me up and and uh, I called Mary over and she's, she's trying to figure out what's going on. We finally, this is 3.30 in the morning, you know, we're not too awake. So finally we had to get the manual out and read and the print was so fine and so small, yeah, very, very ridiculous. But we read through and we finally discovered that it was a, a routine check that they do every few months. And it just happened to be last night and we weren't warned about it. So, um, but that was interesting because I got a lot of sleep yesterday. Uh, the medication they give me, uh, and I believe that's coming to an end soon too in the name of Jesus. But it does make me a bit tired and I, I do a lot of sleeping off and on throughout the day. So praise God, I got enough yesterday that last night didn't bother me too much. Although it's no fun waking up in the middle of the night. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and I wanna start it's hard to say where uh, the beginning of this subject is because the gifts of the Spirit and, and spiritual giftings go clear back to the beginning. And, uh, but I want to deal primarily with New Testament, New Covenant applications. So I'm not going to go clear back into Genesis and start there. <clears throat> but I wanted to start off with what should be a foundation of any teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And that foundation uh, should be the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now that, uh, people call that different things, different names. Baptism of the Holy Ghost, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost, receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, hey Steve, praise the Lord. Good to have you with us tonight. <clears throat> so there's a number of titles or phrases that are used to describe one thing and what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As we talk about the giftings or the gifts of the Spirit, uh, and there's giftings and there's anointings, uh, we're, we're concentrating on the giftings tonight and probably the next few weeks. The, um, the starting point is being filled with the Spirit. Some believe you know, I know there's denominations that believe that when you get born again, you got all there is. That uh, you got the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, then 
Uh, most of those denominations that believe that also don't believe that any of the gifts operate today. They've all passed away. But yet Jesus said that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit as, a pro as the Father promised, and he'll be with you forever. So that does not uh, coincide with some people's beliefs that the giftings have passed away. But um, let's read Acts chapter 8. We're going to start there because the scripture talks different, speaks differently regarding the gifts of the Spirit than a lot of people do. So I'm going to take God's word rather than uh, what people think and what they rationalize. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 14 from the Amplified Translation, Now when the apostles, or special messengers at Jerusalem, heard that the country of Samaria had accepted and welcomed the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And they came down and prayed for them that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then the apostles laid their hands on them one by one, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now we know they did because it says they did. But we also know that it was a separate experience from the new birth. See, the new birth is a belief in Jesus and a confession of him as Lord. And it declares that they had received, Samaria had received the message, the gospel, and they had received Jesus. They were now believers, but they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not until the apostles went down and told them about it, let them know there was a uh, further uh, uh, infilling or power filling or anointing, whatever you want, term you want to use, a further experience uh, that's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then it says that after they ministered to them, they, they prayed, they laid hands on them one by one, and they all, all, not just some, all of them received the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. All right. Is the other camera working there? Nope. 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 It keeps flashing, reconnecting. Armin said he's having trouble staying on because the connection is not good. Yeah. <clears throat> I apologize to anybody that's having to switch over. Uh, if you hear any of this, uh, switch over to Facebook and uh, join us there. So the scripture doesn't just indicate. It clearly tells us that there is a separate experience outside or beyond salvation. I don't mean to be mean that it's more important than salvation but it was not included in the one act of making Jesus Lord of your life. That when you got born again, that then opened the door for you to receive the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. But you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you're born again. No, there's no unbeliever out there that's baptized the Holy Ghost. You have to be born again. So, and you can't get into this area of manifestations or uh, anointings of the Spirit until you're born again. So that obviously would be the first step. And then the second step is being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I'm just going to use that term uh, for the sake of our study. All right, now, the Scripture indicates the second event after the new birth. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples... He said unto them, now, it says he found disciples. That means they had heard the gospel message, and they are believers. Uh, they would not be called disciples otherwise. And then he asked them a question. Uh, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It even declares there that they believed. And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto them were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus, the anointed one. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on us, now stop there, even if the separation is just a minute or two, they received, they prayed and they received Jesus and they were baptized. And then it says that um, 
And when Paul laid his hands on them, like they did up here in the, in the other uh, scriptures we read, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So we have the, the first two instances that we're reading right now <clears throat> about people being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Both of them are clearly second experiences after the new birth. And so the first qualification is you must be born again. The second one is you have to find out that there is the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit so that you can believe and receive. Just like you had to hear about Jesus and believe and receive Him, you have to hear something from somebody about the Holy Spirit, the infilling or the baptizing, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you have to choose to accept and believe that and receive that by faith. You notice it doesn't say that they made anybody uh, get filled with the Spirit. It doesn't say they made anybody get baptized in the Spirit. It says that they prayed for them and the people received. Anything we receive from God has to be received by faith. My healing is by faith. My new heart is by faith. By the way, did I share my new name? Uh, my my uh, daughter said it's my new Indian name because I'm part Cherokee. Uh, my new name is William New Heart Emmons because I have a new heart in the name of Jesus. And I'll be off the medication and I'll be, I'll be back bigger, better, and stronger. Maybe not physically bigger. I don't think I want to put back on the weight that I had. But uh, the word that God gave my son Will in Australia and, and had me speak uh, when I was in the hospital and he was on the phone is, uh, I'm the bionic man. And God spoke that to William in Australia and um, that I would come back uh, stronger and better than I was before. So I received that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So every week you're gonna see me getting better and better and better. I, I call myself whole now in Jesus' name. All right, so nothing is forced on you, even healing. Is that forced in you? God does not force anybody to receive anything that he's providing for them. Otherwise, he'd be just a dictator. <clears throat> God offers salvation. God offers the baptism of the Holy Spirit to empower us. That's, by the way, that's the real reason for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to empower us. Jesus told the disciples not to even go out and minister yet until they went and waited or tarried in Jerusalem waiting for the outpouring of the Spirit. And he said, when you receive that outpouring, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. So the power was to cause us to become a believer that would be a witness to the world around us. And I believe that as we live our lives in faith by the power of God, that people see and hear by seeing the testimony of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So the, the, the um, baptism of the Holy Spirit or the infilling or outpouring, whatever term you want to use, was something that was promised. I want you to go to John chapter 14, verse 16 from the King James translation. Jesus is talking here. And he says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You notice he says another comforter. We have Jesus. Jesus is our comforter. But the Bible also calls the Holy Spirit our comforter. And Jesus said, I'm going to ask the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide or live with you forever. Well, if he's going to be with us forever, then so are the gifts. The gifts are going to operate in and through the church until we enter into eternity and there's no need for gifts anymore. So forever has to do with the time frame we're living in and beyond in the sense that the Holy Spirit will never leave us. He'll be part of our lives uh, throughout eternity. But the gifts are not going to be needed because we will all be walking in our glorified bodies. Hallelujah for that. Amen. <clears throat> now, verse 17 says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit is going to live in us, going to dwell, make his home in us, and be in us and with us wherever we go. 
You say, well, I'm kind of backslidden. I'm not really going to church. I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not praying. But the Holy Spirit hasn't left you. Jesus hasn't left you. He hasn't said, ah, King's X, you, you, you goofed up. You didn't keep uh, my word. And, and uh, so I'm pulling out. Now, Jesus didn't pull out. The Holy Spirit didn't pull out. You've got uh, the Heavenly Father is your, is your Father God. Jesus said that He and, and the Father would come and dwell in you. And then here we have the promise of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. I don't care how far you get away from God. Uh, eventually, the Holy Spirit's going to get through and begin to draw you back. And I can tell you over my lifetime so far, I've seen a lot of people that have strayed, gotten away from God. Maybe just got lukewarm, uh, Irving Cole, where they, they don't read their Bible and pray and, and don't really uh, show any signs of being a believer per se. But the Holy Spirit's in there. What's he doing? He's prompting. He's moving them toward the Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14 from the King James translation, after the the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. You know the story where the people were amazed because they came to find out what all this noise, all this racket was about. And it says that they heard the disciples speaking in their own dialect. Not just their own language, but their own dialect. And there were Jews from all over the world and proselytes as well to Judaism. And they were from every nation, on the earth from every uh, culture, from uh, all even small villages back in the backwoods or whatever it might be. And there were people there, but the disciples were speaking their particular dialect. Well, if you got a hundred different languages and dialects, how can the disciples speak all those different ones? It wasn't that the disciples were speaking different dialects, they were speaking in tongues, the Bible says, but the people heard them in their dialect. So that was a supernatural thing. The disciples speaking out by the Spirit and the Holy Spirit giving the people, the hearers, the ability to hear in their tongue, their dialect. So that was a miracle. So the people began to question, well, how is this possible? And uh, they, they, these guys must be drunk with new wine. And, and so finally Peter stands up and it says, standing up with the eleven, he lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this, now listen to this, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now I didn't do a, a, a search today as I was going over my notes to find out how, how many years before the day of Pentecost, the prophet Joel lived, but I can tell you it was a long time. It was longer than a, uh, an average lifespan, much longer. But the prophet Joel wrote about this experience. And it goes on, verse 17. And it shall come to pass. Here's what prophet Joel is saying. It shall come to pass in the last days. And let me stop there for a second. <clears throat> the last days began with the church end times began with the church. And we're still in that end time, last day, 70th week time frame of the Bible. Uh, it has not expired. Uh, we know that there's a, if I can use the terminology, man has a lease, a lease on the earth for basically 6,000 years. In other words, man is in control of his destiny and he controls the earth and he controls what's under his authority. But there, there's another thousand year period and between the 6,000th year and the beginning of the thousand year reign, there's a seven year gap and there's a time frame that is not clearly described in years and it's called end times. And it began with Jesus and he even talked about it to the Jews uh, in Matthew 24. And then, of course, the apostles talked about it to the church as well. So we're in that time frame right now. We haven't begun the 70th week, which would be the tribulation period. And we haven't begun the last thousand years, which would be the millennial reign. So we're in that 
time gap in between the two. Uh, and God does that. Throughout the Bible, we find things going on, and then there's parenthetical things that take place in the middle of something that's going on at the time. Uh, parenthetical simply means it was inserted in the middle of something. So we have a time gap inserted in the middle of our, not in the middle, but in our seven year, 7,000 year time frame. And that is coming quickly to an end. If you read the signs of the times listed in the New Testament, you can clearly see evidence of that throughout the world. And it's exciting that God chose you and me to live on the earth during this time frame. And I, I like to think of it this way. God knew that we would be a generation of people that would walk by faith, would believe God and, and take God at his word other than you know, our emotions or feelings or what somebody tells us, but we would believe the word and we would be strong enough in faith that we would overcome and end this 6,000 year period in victory. And that's what's happening right now. The church is rising and uh, the believers are rising in the name of Jesus. There's revival happening all across this land. In fact, there's revival happening around the world. You may be not hear about it, the news doesn't report it. So you gotta be connected to ministries that know what's going on. But it's a mighty move of God, even in this country. The church is waking up to what's been going on. And we're starting to, to finally recognize the truth of what's been happening these last few years. Not just with the election, I'm talking about the last few years. There's been a plan the devil has set in motion to stop the plan of God. But praise God, the devil can't win. It's impossible for him to win. He's been defeated already by what Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not teaching on prophecy tonight, but, you know, it's hard to read any scripture out of the Bible and not have some prophetic link to it. All right, so he said, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's the day, that's the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the spirit. So that's a specific day. Now, we might be able to count specific uh, days, months, and years from that point. I'm not really sure, but it seems to me like I've read that. But that's not, all, that's not important. What's important is that that was the day Joel talked about. And that God said he'd pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And that day is continuing. In fact, maybe, maybe we're in a long spiritual day right now. All right. And he says, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Well, my mom heard the message of the end times, the message of salvation, the message of faith, the message of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And she believed uh, in the Bible and the end times, the last days. My grandmother heard the message, came out of the Catholic Church as a young lady, born again, spirit-filled. God called her into the ministry. My grandmother started a church down in Venice, California, at, uh, right there, uh, at just off the circle of Venice. If you know Venice at all, you know where the circle is. Just off the first street corner off that circle, she started a church. I think there's a Mexican restaurant there now. <laughs> but for years, she pastored down there and ministered to people, particularly people that came down to the beach and uh, the, the bodybuilders that would get out there at Muscle Beach and lift weights and oil themselves up. She ministered to all these groups of people down there. And uh, they would come into her chapel and they'd get born again. And uh, you'd be surprised if I could name some names of people that got born again in her church. But there was, uh, she did a mighty work and there's no indication she had a big church, but she did what God called her to do, just like I'm doing what God's called me to do. And even though I may not have a huge congregation at this point in time, uh, somebody's listening. I know that because I see the numbers and we're ministering to thousands of people. So what we have here is we see in, in just three generations of my family that I can tell you for sure, my, well, now four generations, our children, us, our parents, and our grandparents. So we know about four generations who were born again, spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost, that, that preached and taught and lived in times scripture and it says that your sons and daughters shall prophesy well, that's that's what we do that's a 
That, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy. It will speak prophetically, will speak by an unction of the Holy Spirit and, and not through just our own head knowledge. And then it says, and your young men, that's me, shall see visions, or if I can say it this way, your young men, young men shall have visions, and your old men or older men shall dream dreams. Well, praise God, I've been in a position for a number of years where I, I have both, I have visions and I have dreams. They're not all uh, real detailed. They're not all, uh, you know, earth-shaking kind of visions. Sometimes it's just a personal revelation, something God's speaking to me. But, um, I, so I don't know you, when, when that we reach that point, your old men shall dream dreams. I don't know how old that is. Um, you know, Joel was, lived a long time ago, and I think people lived longer back then. But nevertheless, uh, your young men shall have vision, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid servants and my hand, or my, my servants, and on my maid uh, handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. And they shall prophesy. So God's servants and handmaids are those of us that are called into the ministry. We're children of God, but we have another title, servants of God. And it's by our choice. God called us, God anointed us, but we have to choose it. And I, up to the calling that came on me in 1973, I had no thought, no interest, no desire to be in the ministry. I was an architectural designer at the time. I had a good job making good money for the time. I was able to support my family on one paycheck and drive a decent car and, and so on. And, you know, rent an apartment. <laughs> but that was what I thought I was called to do, that I was called to be a great Christian architect and that I would design custom homes and design uh, church buildings for ministries uh, that were growing and increasing needed church facilities. And that I would be a modern day, well, maybe not a good comparison, but modern day Michelangelo. <laughs> maybe not doing all the stuff he did, but with that same creative ability to design things that would glorify God. And I designed a building for our ministry that we have not yet built. I've still got the plans for it. I've still got the design for it. And it's got a lot of symbolism built into it. That, that's just something that came by the Spirit as I was designing and drawing it. But I thought that's what I was going to do for a living. And uh, there were people that speak to me and talk about, well, you know, you, you talk about things of God so much that you ought to be in the ministry. Or somebody would prophesy over me and say, one day you're going to be a pastor. And just different things like that. And that until God actually called me, and I heard his voice. That was all negative to me. That was all just people wish they'd mind their own business, you know, and leave me alone. And then 1973, God called me with an audible voice. And, uh, and I didn't know what I was called to do. Um, it took six months for me to understand my calling, which first was that of a teacher. And uh, it, it was almost immediately, once I understood that, doors began to open and we began to go out and teach and hold meetings in different places, in churches, and different places God would tell us to, to rent. And I began to teach and minister and operate in the gifts of the Spirit and ministered healing and had some great miracles take place. And then um, one day, somebody made a comment to me about being a pastor. And I, I thought, no way I'm going to be a pastor. I've never seen a happy pastor. When I was growing up, we went to a lot of churches because we moved a lot. And uh, so I, I got to see a lot of pastors and there was always fussing going on and people in the church giving them a hard time and the board of directors, the board of elders or deacons was giving them a hard time and just, you know, a lot of nonsense flesh happening in the church. And I thought, man, I don't want nothing to do with that. So I thought I'll be a traveling teacher, not an evangelist because my main message is not salvation, uh, not the new birth, my main, uh, main message is teaching of the word and ministering healing. That's my primary calling. But in 1977, God did speak to me for the second time in an audible voice and anointed me to be a pastor, to be a shepherd in the church. 
And as one man said recently, the, the highest calling, he thought, was that of the pastor, the shepherd, because you're dealing directly with people and not just, you know, come in, do your thing and leave. You're there with the people all the time. You live within the body of believers and, and you find out a lot of things. They find out about you. And I thought, I, I don't want nothing to do with that. But then one night uh, on the way home from a Bible study, God spoke to me in an audible voice. He called me as a pastor, anointed me. So now there were three anointings, three callings on my life. First, that of the teacher. Second, the healing ministry. And the third, the pastoral ministry. Now today, I still operate in those. I'm not sitting in front of a physical congregation right now. My congregation is online. And I appreciate all of, all of you that watch and, and are faithful to this because you, you help me keep me going, I gotta tell you. Uh, it's a real challenge. I spent the last year and a half preaching to cameras because uh, everything in California was shut down. And even though we, we allowed people to come, uh, it started off just preaching to cameras. And then a handful of people began to get bold and say, well, bless God, I'm going to church. And they started coming out to the services. But even then it was kind of strange because you'd have four or five, maybe six people spread throughout the seating area of the congregation. And so that was strange, but God is preparing me for what I'm involved with right now, which is online church, online Bible study, online ministry. And uh, it's not so strange anymore. I'm, I'm used to it. And I know that thousands are out there and thousands are being ministered to. Again, I said, I know that because I see the numbers. All right, so let me go back to this. He said, I'll pour out my spirit. They'll prophesy, they'll have dreams, they'll have visions. This is what Joel was speaking about, and Peter is the one that said, this is what Joel was talking about. What you see and what you hear is the, the, the answer or the um, manifestation of a prophecy given hundreds of years before the fact. And so that's something that there's no end on. It, it doesn't say it's going to quit or end as long as we're living on this earth in this natural body. We're going to need the gifts of spirit. We're going to need the, the gifts of healings. We need the working of miracles. We need the uh, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and, uh, the, the gift of faith. Uh, I don't know if I've missed one of them or not, but anyway, we need all these gifts. Why? Because people would die without them. Because a lot of people don't take time to build their faith, spend time in the Word like we're doing now, and, and take the time to build their faith by a foundation of the Word in their lives, and then by the words of their mouth, their declarations of faith. You know, somebody said, well, I don't believe in that confession stuff. Well, what do you do about the scriptures that say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Because that scripture clearly tells us whatever we put in us in abundance is what's going to come out of us, particularly when you get under pressure. What comes out of me is healing. What comes out of me is blessing. What comes out of me is prosperity. What comes out of me is forgiveness. What comes out of me is the patience and long suffering of God. Why? Because that's what's in the word and that's what I fed into my spirit man. So when the pressure comes on, what starts to come out without even thinking about it is what the word says on each of those categories, depending on what I'm dealing with. Right now, I, I say I have a new heart. Why? Because I speak of things that were not as though they are. I didn't, I needed, uh, three weeks ago, I needed something that had po happened positive to my heart. I needed healing. Well, I just decided to take it a step further and get a new heart. Why well, just get the old one healed? Why not just get a new one? Amen? Hallelujah. The Bible does say, if we believe that the things we say shall come to pass, we shall have whatsoever we saith. So that's why I say I have a new heart. That's why I say I have a full head of natural colored hair, strong, healthy hair. And, and anything else that I face, I say, my God supplies all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now you can say, well, you're speaking prophetically. I'm, I'm declaring the word of God. You can call it prophetic. You can call it uh, whatever you want, confessions. I'm declaring what God says. You know, it just makes sense to, if I'm going to open my mouth and say something, to say something that agrees with God. Because those are the things God said. So if you want to know what God has to say, get in his word to find out. Amen? Amen. All right. So 
Now we know that this prophecy of Joel was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So let's go there, Acts chapter 2, verse 32, just two verses here. This Jesus, God has raised up where we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath, past tense, shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So again, this is a continuation of what Peter was talking about in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. He's just giving a further explanation, and he's saying what you're seeing here, he's saying it point blank. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Hallelujah. Now, let's go back and read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the disciples, were all with one accord in one place. Now, i got to tell you, there's a revelation right there in that statement. And what is it? They were in one accord. They were in one place. The church came together in one place, not a bunch here and a bunch there and a bunch somewhere else and a bunch in their homes. And you know, Now, it's okay that we have home groups. It's okay that we have uh, you know, smaller churches around. But there's a real calling, I believe, in these end times for the church to come together as the church, not as a denomination, not as a group separate and apart, but to come together as believers, to receive the full benefits of what the Holy Spirit has for us. So I believe denominational barriers, they've been, they've been being torn down for over 30 years, 40 years, because we began to see it back in the 1970s. God's not done removing those barriers. And the Bible says that that uh, we're going to continue in this until the, 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 uh, the fullness of faith, until the church comes into the fullness of faith. And that hasn't happened yet, but we're moving closer and closer to it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, he says, we're witnesses of this. Therefore, being by the right hand of the Father, the right hand of God exalted. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse here. Uh, when the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I'll get back to that. One accord. Not just being in one place. They were in agreement. They didn't go to church with attitudes. They weren't there trying to tell the, the uh, apostles or the disciples how to run things. They weren't there to try and get some position in the church. They weren't there to get recognition. They were there to hear the good news. You say, well, you know, when I go to church, I want to hear this. I want to hear that. I I don't need uh, healing, I need this. Or I don't need prosperity message, I need this. Well, it's really interesting because that mean, that puts you in place of the Holy Ghost. You know better than the Holy Ghost what you need. You come in with a mindset, I, will, I need to hear this message, I don't need all that other stuff. That faith, that healing, that deliverance, that I don't need. Well, you're not the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit knows what you need. So when you go to church, you come with an open heart, with an open mind. And you, you need to begin to say, Holy Spirit, I'm not here for position. I'm not here for glory. I'm not here to be exalted uh, somehow. I'm not here to try and run or govern things. <clears throat> I'm here to serve. I'm here to be built up in your word, Father, so I can be a stronger believer that gets results as a believer. Amen. All right. Verse 2. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all, how many? All. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there we have the pattern. You want to get results in your church? Get to come together. Come together and come in agreement. Come with open hearts and open minds to hear whatever God has to say to us and, and ready to receive. But then you got to take it a step further. Not only be ready to receive, you got to make a decision. I'm going to be a doer of the word. Whatever word I hear tonight, whatever word I hear Sunday morning, I'm going to act on that word. I'm going to be a doer of the word and apply it to my life. Because you see, faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding actions is dead. You say you're a believer, but then you come under attack and you don't pray and believe God. You don't declare the end result from the beginning of the attack like Jesus did, and like we're taught to. We need to, the moment we come under attack, and I don't care what it is, whatever it may be, 
we go to the Word of God and find out what God thinks about it, what He says about it, and then that's what we declare. And it's always the end result. It's not more of whatever the attack is. It's getting us through and out of that attack. Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> John chapter 7, verse 37 I want to start there and go read two, three verses. Uh, I want to make this statement, though, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not, of, out, is not about the evidence. There's a lot of people who think it's about speaking in tongues. No, that's just the evidence. You see, uh, all the other giftings that you see in, the, in, the, uh, for, in Corinthians were also manifested in, throughout the Old Testament. The gifts of healing, the working of miracles, the gift of faith, prophecy. That was all in the Old Testament. The only thing that is new in the way of giftings in the New Testament is speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues, which goes along with it. So, it, But it's not about that. Just because you get filled with the Spirit and can speak in tongues doesn't mean you've got everything you need and, and now you got it all, you know. No, that's just the next step in our growth. Hallelujah. I praise God that I can speak in tongues. I'm going to give you some reasons for that in a few minutes. But it's not about the speaking in tongues. It's about being endued with power. It's, it's about the work that God's calling you to do in the, in the earth, not about the giftings or anointings you have. Those are just tools to get the job done. Amen. Praise God. All right. So in John chapter 7, verse 37, King James translation, in the last day, that great day of, of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now listen, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit could not be poured out until Jesus was glorified because he was to be another comforter until Jesus returns. And he hadn't left yet. So there would have been, you know, Jesus walking around, the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Spirit was operating in the earth, no doubt about it. But that baptism of the Holy Spirit was not yet manifested. When, after Jesus was caught up into heaven, and took his seat at the right hand of the Father as a conquering uh, king. Then, uh, you know, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost came, and the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Spirit, and that's what he's talking about, the Holy Spirit, was poured out. Amen. All right, so. Uh, let's see where I am in my notes here. Okay, so what are some of the benefits? Why do we talk about speaking in tongues when it's only one of the gifts of the Spirit. Because it's one of the gifts that manifests the greatest amount of benefits. So I want to share some of them with you. Uh, number one, the, what we all understand it to be is the initial evidence. How do you know you've been filled with the Spirit if you can't speak in tongues? If you, if you are filled with, the, filled with the Spirit, you can speak in tongues even if you haven't done it yet. That's only, you know, the intimidation factor where the devil's trying to intimidate you, trying to make, make you believe his lie that, oh, you're just making it up or you're copying somebody else. That's a lie of the devil. Don't believe it. When you open your mouth and you lend your voice to that, that sound that's coming up from down inside of you and you begin to utter that sound, even though it's not intelligible words, what's happening is the Holy Spirit is beginning teaching you a heavenly language. The Bible does talk about language of, of angels, and I'm sure there's sometimes we are, when we're speaking in tongues, we're speaking the language of angels. But there are many, many languages, and there's just a generic term called speaking in tongues. But it is the initial evidence that you've received. So if you haven't spoken in tongues yet, and you think you got all there is, and you got the Spirit when you got born again, you need to go back and read what the Word says about it so that you can actually receive the infilling, the outpouring, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
Now, number two benefit, these are not in any particular order, spiritual edification. Why do we speak in tongues? Well, one of them is spiritual edification, 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. That word edify means to charge like a battery. Batteries can be recharged, particularly nowadays. We have a lot of rechargeable batteries. And so what he's talking about here is some, th some aspect of us spiritually can be recharged as we speak or pray in tongues. It says, but he that prophesieth edify the church. So there's the gift of prophecy is to charge or build up the church. But tongues is for the individual believer to build himself up. That's one aspect, one of the benefits. Then we go to Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Amplified Translation. And behold, I will send forth upon you what my Father has promised, but remain in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power or endued with power from on high. So this is what he told the disciples. There's going to come a point in time when something's going to happen and you're going to be clothed with power, clothed, covered, baptized into power, dunamis. That happened on the day of Pentecost, but it didn't stop that day. It continues every time you get born again and spirit filled and begin to speak in tongues, you're drawing from that power source. You're drawing out the glory, the power of God. You're doing it with words and eventually in, uh, in actions. Amen. The next thing I want to show you uh, is Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. So you're going to receive power, and it will cause you to be a witness for the kingdom of God, for Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives. The fourth thing I have listed here that is a benefit of being filled with the Spirit and speaking or praying in tongues is that it's one of the ways that we can always know that we're praying the perfect will of the Father. There's a lot of times when we go to prayer, and you don't know what God's will is, you, and you know that. You know that you go to prayer wondering how you should pray, because you, you don't know how to pray. But the Bible says that when you pray by the Spirit, the Spirit prayeth through us the perfect will of the Father. So you have that promise that when you don't know how to pray, you can switch over into tongues, and, and whatever you're praying out by the Spirit is the perfect will of God, even if you don't yet understand it. And sometimes you won't understand it until it manifests. Now, I got to tell you, when God spoke to us about moving to Tulsa, relocating our ministry to Tulsa, uh, I wasn't interested in hearing that. And uh, I, I told my wife, I said, well, I'll pray about it. And I did. And it did not take me long at all for God to speak to me and say, this is my doing. And I want you to make this change. I want you to commit to this. And we did. And I look back now on the events of the last few weeks, and I realize that God put me in the right place for the things I would need these last few weeks. And praise God for it. Hallelujah. Because if we had not been obedient to the Spirit of God, I don't know what would have happened if, if we were still there uh, in, in L.A., uh, where we were living before. So I know that God's timing is revealed to us. Even as we pray in tongues, we don't recognize what God's timing is. We don't always recognize the path we're on, but we, we walk by faith. We take one day at a time. Amen? And, but as we pray in the Spirit, we're always praying out the perfect will of God. So to me, the, the two most important ways to pray are you pray according to the Word of God, and when you run out of Scripture, you pray in tongues so that you know that the words you are learning is going to be understood. You're going to get revelation of it by the Spirit and going to walk that out in your life in the perfect will of the Father for you. Hallelujah. All right. Let's see. We've got about five minutes left, it looks like. All right. So the next one I want to share with you, that was, that was uh, 
By the way, did we read all of Romans 8, 26 to 27? No. Okay. <clears throat> so too the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit and what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. So we can trust the Holy Spirit to always be working on our behalf to bring us into God's perfect plan. And even now, as I sit here and I'm doing this online Bible study, I'm walking toward the perfect plan of God. I'm always walking toward God's plan for my life. And you should be too. Excuse me for this. That's great iced teas. My own concoction. That's really good. All right. So, the next benefit is when you combine speaking in tongues with interpretation of tongues, which the Apostle Paul said is equal to prophecy. When I speak a message out, whether it's right here, right now, or in front of a congregation, or on a one-to-one -one basis, and I speak out in tongues, Paul said there needs to be an interpretation. He said, and if nobody interprets, then let the one speaking in prophetically in tongues stop. He said, unless you interpret, because in prophet or, or tongues with interpretation, he equates to prophecy, which edifies the church. So we can pray in tongues for ourselves all we want, because the Holy Spirit's praying the perfect will of God. And we can even pray in a service over somebody and pray for a little bit in tongues, but eventually that tongues that the Holy Spirit is praying through you for that individual needs to come to a place of understanding what you're supposed to do with it. And that's where the interpretation of tongues comes along. So the Holy Spirit is not going to say to you, okay, this is the interpretation, thus saith the Lord. No, many times it's just a knowing. It's just, you know, you, you, you spoke out, you prayed over somebody in tongues, or over a situation in tongues, and then you just knew what, what you're supposed to do. You just, you know, God didn't have to speak to you. Nobody had to speak prophetically to you. But you got the interpretation by the Holy Ghost of what you'd already prayed out, which was the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. All right, about three minutes left. First uh, Corinthians 14, 5. I would that you all spake with tongues. See, he doesn't limit who can speak in tongues. I, I, I have all of you speak in tongues. But rather that you prophesy. For greater is he, now he's talking about in a church setting. Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh in, in a, uh, with tongues, except he interpret, so that the church may receive edifying. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about the individual experience and the application of the gifts of the Spirit on you as an individual. But then he talks about you in the church setting, in a congregational experience, and what the gifts are supposed to do in and through you in regard to the congregational setting. You find in uh, this chapter both vertical ministry, this is ministry to the Father, and, and we do that in tongues, we do that in songs and, and worship, praise, and we do it in confessing, confessing the Word of God. But then there's horizontal ministry, and that's ministry to the body. We get into a service, there's, there's always ministry to the Father and ministry to the body. And when you operate the gifts, you need to know how to apply the gifts to those different ministries. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll pick it up next week. This is going to be an ongoing series. I don't know how long, but we're going to continue with it. If, um, if we're a blessing to you, and uh, you're not already a partner with us, we ask you to pray about it and pray about becoming a partner with this ministry. It's our partners, literally, that are giving us the ability to do what we're doing and reaching around the world 
with this message of faith. So I want you to pray about it and ask the Lord what he'd have you do. Whatever he presses upon you to do on a monthly basis, just be faithful to it. And we'll agree with you, we'll agree for the hundredfold return that every dime you give into this ministry, not only will it be used wisely by the direction of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to produce a harvest back into your life, not just 30-fold, not just 60-fold, but I'm agreeing with you, Pastor Mary and I are agreeing with you, for no less than a hundredfold return on your giving. And you can't beat that. There's no investment out there that does better than that. So we're going to agree with you on that. Let me tell you how you can give if you don't know yet. We do have a PayPal account. The PayPal account uh, is, uh, the email for that is wemmons one at gmail.com. And that'll take you to our page. And that is linked to our ministry account. And uh, you give through that and you'll go directly into our ministry account. We also have Venmo. And the, the way you find that, you, you go online in the Venmo app, V-E-N-M-O. <clears throat> you have to sign up and register. If you've already done that, then you look, you type in that little at symbol, at William dash Emmons dash 10. That'll take you to our Venmo account, which is linked to our bank account. And that will go directly into our ministry. Now, there, the other ways you can give, if you want to partner with us, you can give through check uh, or money order by simply mailing it. And we, let me give you our mailing address. It's CFC, stands for Covenant Faith Center. CFC, Post Office Box, 141074. Post Office Box, 141074. Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. 74014. 74014. All right, that's how you can give through mailing. And, and most of our giving does come in through the mail right now, although we have some that give uh, through PayPal and Venmo. And thank you. Uh, it doesn't matter how it comes as long as it comes, right? <laughs> now, I also want to mention that if you want to uh, send um, or if you want to uh, give by text or email, uh, you can text or email uh, your debit or credit card information uh, to the email I already mentioned the same for PayPal is wemmons one at gmail.com. You email to us your debit or credit card information and we'll run it and then we'll delete that out so that nobody can get their hands on it. Uh, but make sure you give us all the numbers on the back of the card including the three digit code number and we'll need the zip code where the statement goes every month to that account and the amount, of course, you want to give. Now, just know that if you give through that method, uh, that um, the, when we run it, the credit or debit card company takes out about 3.8% as their fee. So just be aware of that. Uh, if you want to send that same information through text, you can send it to 818. 679-7067 and do all the same things you do if you were to email it. We'll get the information, we'll run the card for the amounts you say and then we'll delete that. And that way your information is protected. So pray about it. Continue to pray for me as I grow stronger every day and uh, particularly to get off the medications that I'm on. Uh, I've had a bit of a challenge at times for, with dizziness and uh, I, I'm just fighting that in the name of Jesus. I win. I win. I'm not a quitter. So pray for, for me for those things. And pray for Mary because she's got to put up with me. And she's got she's uh, got to be aware of me at all times. And uh, I appreciate her looking after me and helping me out. But I'm healed. I'm redeemed. I'm delivered. I have my new heart in the name of Jesus. Hey, guys, we love you. Appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Trust we've been a blessing to you. Trust you've learned something or at least been encouraged in something and that you can share it with others. And please do that. Please share this with others and make sure that you let people know how they can listen to us online. With that, I'm going to say good night. God bless you. And we'll see you Sunday morning, California time, 10 o'clock. Other than that, you got to figure out what the time zone is. Amen. <laughs>